Well, <clears throat> this video is going to first air on Easter Sunday, 2023. And I don't normally do uh, messages necessarily on, you know, like Mother's Day message and a Father's Day message and that type of thing. But this year, the timing is so perfect. I am going to do a, what I guess you'd call it an Easter Sunday message, or I'd really rather call it Resurrection Day message. And I'm just, because the timing is perfect, he's been having me teach on what he's been, showed me from the parable of the orange that was last Sunday and how God is really duplicating Christ in the earth that you know Christ was the seed of life that God sowed in order to reap a crop of life <laughs> in the earth I haven't said it exactly that way but he's been talking to me that way so uh, did you know every seed in a way is a resurrection when it when it starts producing life it, in a way it's a resurrection Jesus talked about himself being the seed now today I'm going by the instruction of the Holy Ghost he did not let me prepare a lot of you know a, a detailed message like I often do so I'm going to refer to a lot of scriptures you if you really you may have to do a little search to find them <laughs> uh, but anyway uh, Jesus speaking about himself says you know unless a if a corn of wheat abides alone it just it's just one but if it falls into the ground and die then it produces a big harvest now, that's not a direct quote but that's what he was saying and he was really talking about himself see as long as jesus was alive in his own physical body he was the only human vessel now again every time i say this we have new people and I, they might be going are you saying jesus wasn't divine jesus was divine okay he was god he was man he was fully god he was fully man he is the god slash man man slash god he, about himself he would say he would call himself the son of god and he would call himself the son of man so okay <laughs> So during the time of his physical life on earth, when he had his own physical body, he was the only human vessel on the planet that had life in him. And what I mean is the life of God, a spirit which was really alive to God and actually born of God's spirit. He was the only one. Everybody else was descended from Adam and Eve. And, uh, you know, you can read all about this in Romans chapters 3, 4, and 5, and Genesis chapters beginning in chapter 3 especially, about the fall of man. Because what happened, uh, <laughs> the book of Romans says it this way, by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. Of course, we know that's talking about the first man, Adam. Now, God forgave them, in the garden and how we know that is he clothed them with animal skins which that's the first death physical death recorded in the Bible where something innocent had to die uh, something innocent had to shed its blood you know the Bible says without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sin so God we are not told what kind of animal Gary what do you think well my opinion and it's just an opinion I think it was a lamb or, or maybe one for each of them. But uh, anyway, I think it was a lamb. But God covered them with animal skins, meaning something innocent had to die in their place. And of course, that's a foreshadowing of, of Christ on the cross, the Lamb of God shedding His blood for us. So God forgave them in that sense, looking forward to Christ on the cross. But see, if the gospel ended at the cross, it'd be just like with Adam and Eve. They were forgiven at that point, but they were still changed from what God originally made them. Read it yourself in Genesis chapter 1. Three times in two consecutive verses, it says, In the image of God created he them. Male and female created he them. And in the image of God, God made them. In his image he breathed from something that wasn't oxygen he breathed into them he breathed life into them from within himself the spiritual life 
is what he breathed into into them into Adam and Adam became alive and it was alive with the very life of God but then again when he sinned it says by man sin entered into by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin Adam died spiritually the very day that he and Eve partook of the fruit of the knowledge of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil it says their eyes were opened and they began see they only knew good before then now they knew good and evil and anyway there's a whole host of things we could teach there but the point I want to make today is the first act of mercy was the blood innocent blood being shed for them that's an act of forgiveness that's an act of mercy and but the, and you know God could have a a relate a relationship let's say a fellowship with them that way they were forgiven but they were not changed they were still now see death had their spirit had gone from light to dark uh, from life to death they were dead in their spirit and that's not what God wanted he didn't want to go through all it you know <laughs> he didn't want them to just be forgiven and remain sinners if the gospel of Jesus Christ ended at the cross if that if that was the finish if that was the end we're all still lost we're all still sinners and the doctrine I grew up under which many many denominations teach this is that you're forgiven but you're not changed you're still that same old sinner just saved by grace now well, listen, that is not what the Bible teaches. It says, I was an old sinner. You got that right. But see, I got saved by grace. And now I have become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm no longer a, a child of, of sin. I'm no longer a, even really of Adam anymore. I'm getting... <laughs> you know, the Bible calls Jesus the last Adam. Well, why is that? Well, the same way that the first Adam spawned a whole species of people, everybody on earth. You know, Eve is called the mother of all living. I don't care if you're black, white, yellow, red, round-eyed, slanty-eyed, <laughs> polka dot striped. I don't care <laughs> if you're a human. <laughs> mother, Eve is the mother of all, all people. She's the mother of us all. We're all descended from Adam and Eve and are in, as, that, as children of Adam. And we're all born that way. We're all born with a sinful nature. But see, Jesus is called the last Adam. And the reason why he, like the first Adam, he is spawning also a new species of humans. There's a whole species that he is producing when you put faith in his finished work. You become a new creature, the Bible says. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. Now, what it's talking about is the, the spirit. The spirit, you would literally get reborn in your spirit. Literally get reborn. And that is because of the resurrection. So I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> In my letter this month, I mentioned something that Jesus spoke of in John chapter 9, and that's right after he opened the eyes. He, You know, the man born blind? I mean, this isn't just blindness. This is birth defect blindness. This man had never seen. He was born blind from his mother's womb. And Jesus opened the eyes of the blind. Oh, my goodness. Everybody knew, even his critics knew, this is the power of God. You know, nobody, no human can do that with human ability. God had to be working with him to open the eyes of the blind. And that's what he said. He said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. And I would read that for years and part of me would just wonder, what do you mean the night comes when no man can work? Are you talking about something like the tribulation, I don't know if you're a, a pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, rapture person. One day we're going to get out of here. <laughs> Are you talking about 
something after the rapture? Are you talking about after your second coming? I don't know what you're talking about. The day cometh when no man can work. And obviously he's talking about the supernatural works of God. Because in context, the work that he just did was open the eyes of the man born blind. Well, I, I, I'd read it. You know, on things like that, I gave up a long time ago trying to figure it out. I've learned to just pray it out, <laughs> just keep meditating the Word, pray in the Spirit, and the Holy Ghost will event He'll get it across to you when you're able to handle it. Well, one day I was going through there again, and that same, as I went past that verse, the day cometh when no man can work. And, uh, you know, I just had that question kind of up on the shelf saying, Holy Spirit, I'd love to know what, to, what that means. And this time when I went through there and I, I saw that again, I, I had one of those little uh, short teaching visions that happens on the inside that Pastor Dave Roberson would talk about so often. He said, they're quick. They're like a flash. You've got to catch them. And boy, that's exactly right. And I, but I've also learned if you miss it, if, if you saw it and didn't catch it really, he'll bring it back again. It might be in a dream, might be in a vision, might be while you're wide awake. But in this one, I saw the earth from like outer space and have you ever seen one of those pictures on the, the internet where they show a, a, a satellite picture of the earth at, when, that, when that hemisphere is dark at night and it shows all of the little lights that are on in the earth, you know, like light bulbs. And it's amazing because the United States will just be, at least from, uh, anyway, on the West Coast and from the middle to the East especially, It'll just be full of lights because, you know, electricity is everywhere, lights are everywhere. But then you'll look at that same moment in p parts of Africa and there's hardly any lights, you know. And that's because they don't have nearly the, the electricity and nearly the amount of light bulbs. So if, you can, if you've ever seen one of those, it's, it was a picture kind of like that. Except when I saw it, now again, the, 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 what I'm meditating is the night cometh when no man can work. And, and so I was meditating, I always had that up on the shelf, just praying in the spirit. And this time I saw a, from the, like a satellite, saw the earth, it was dark. There was just one light. Instead of being all those lights, you know, everywhere on this one, there was just one. And I could tell it was coming from the nation of Israel. It kind of zoomed in and I would see the light moving like I knew that what it represented, I knew it was, I knew, I don't know how you know things in visions, but I knew that light was talking about Christ, who is the light of the world. He said, as long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. And I saw that light just moving. And I knew that meant from village to village to village. Here's the light of God, the only human vessel on planet Earth that had the life of God on the inside. He's the only one. Now see, that's why Jesus is called the only begotten Son of God. Now later on, he's called the firstborn of many brethren. Well, that's because, I'll just tell you ahead of time, that's because there is a resurrection. But he is the only, and always will be the only, begotten Son of God in the sense that he was born spiritually alive from his mother's womb. There's only one of those. <laughs> there only ever will be one of those. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Anyway, so in this little vision, I saw this single light and I re was reminded of the prophecies from Isaiah and I didn't look these up and then you can look them up if you, if you, if you want. Matthew also verifies that this is that which was prophesied by the prophet Isaiah and, and paraphrasing, those that sat in darkness they saw a great light. Boy, there it is. They saw a great light because Jesus, when he would come to village to village, I love how Acts 10 38 says it, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Whew. Man, <laughs> that's our Jesus. And here you've got this single human vessel filled with it, the light of God, the life of God on the inside of him. And God has anointed him with the Holy Ghost. This is after John had baptized him and he has been declared the last Adam. Uh, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. 
and John's baptism represented the death of the first Adam and the really the the birth of the of the last Adam uh, the resurrection of the last Adam when he was raised up out of the water and and so God has already accepted that as a as an accomplished fact even though he wouldn't go to the cross for a few more years but he's operating as though he's already been crucified and resurrected he's operating as the son of God the the, the king of the kingdom and that's why Luke 16 16 says the law and the prophets were until John they talk about John the Baptist and specifically talking about the day that Jesus was baptized the law and the prophets were until John since that time since the day that Jesus was <laughs> coronated and crowned Lord and 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 uh, Messiah from that day from the king of the kingdom from that day the kingdom of God is preached Whew. every man must press into it well praise God I take it I feel these I don't know what goosebumps they're not really goosebumps but these they, they flow down my arms when I at certain points and I almost have to whew, just revel in that for a minute <laughs> The gospel is so wonderful. It is so absolutely wonderful. So in my vision, I would see this light moving. And I knew it was him going from village to village, boy. And everywhere he went, he cast out devils. He healed the sick. Miracles took place. We're seeing a demonstration of what God intends for a son of God. Whew. All right. But still my question, what, what is this night? This night, there's a night coming when no man can work and specifically meant no man can work the works of God. Now I'll just go ahead and tell you this in case maybe you've said under this false doctrine also. And when I do this, I'm not trying to disparage anyone. Listen, anybody that preaches Christ and Him crucified, I'm, I'm with you. I bless you. I thank God for you and that people are getting saved under your ministry and the minute the the very denomination I grew up in well thank God you can sure get saved there they preach the cross and they preach it accurately and and you can genuinely get saved okay so I thank thank God for that but when they would teach on that passage that the night cometh when no man can work they would say well after Jesus died well after the last apostle actually they'd go that far but after the last of the 12 apostles died, which was John, they said, well, then that's when the night came. And from that point on, no man has been able to do the works of God. And that's why we don't see miracles and healings today like they saw then. So they're just, they're saying that really the, the whole history after the death of John, that was the, this has all been night when no man can work. Well, that's not true. <laughs> That's not true. I thank God we have a Bible and we have the Holy Ghost. And if you've got those two things, you're really not going to have any excuses for believing deception on that day because Jesus himself said he sent the Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth. So God has done what we do in our universities or should be doing in our universities. God gave us a book and he gave us a teacher. Thank God. I still remember struggling with differential equations and calculus and and all of those uh, you know things in when I went to Oklahoma State University way back in the 60s. <laughs> I grad I'm from the class of 69. <laughs> when I graduated uh, there was no such thing on earth as that I knew of as a handheld calculator even. We were still using uh, slide rules and logarithm books. I mean it was ancient I had already been at graduated and in the engineering profession for about two years before I ever even saw my first the first handheld calculator I ever saw this other engineer had it and <laughs> it was like maybe this long and he carried it in a holster on his hip because he was so proud of it he man and he would show it off to anybody and I still remember it was it cost six hundred and fifty dollars back then like what 71 maybe and, and it was made by Texas Instruments, I remember that, and and uh, $650, and all it would do would add, subtract, multiply, divide, and do square roots. That was it. 
good lord now you can get them at the dollar store you know <laughs> that'll do that same thing but anyway i'm just saying i'm i remember those classes math was always kind of hard for me which is strange for a person to get an engineering degree but man i had to i had to struggle i had to study everybody else was gone they were finished with their homework and gone well they should have been finished with it they could have been finished with it and they were gone to uh, you know drink beer and play pool and stuff and here's gary still with the light on late at night still studying my books but i thank god that they didn't just give me a, a uh, differential equations book they also gave me a teacher and boy did i need that teacher to help and i i didn't have a tutor i wasn't able to go sit one-on-one -on -one. but that teacher my job was to study the book try the book <laughs> make mistakes but then pay attention during class because the teacher was going to explain things that i couldn't comprehend just directly from the book and that's exactly what god has done with the holy spirit that's why Thank God we have the Bible. Do you, do you know why we have so many denominations, different denominations in the body of Christ? You know, they all have, we only have one Bible. <laughs> you know, they're all using the same Bible, but they preach such different things. Well, that is a testimony. The fact that we have so many denominations, that is a testimony to the pride of man, thinking he can understand the divine word of God with his human reasoning without the help of the teacher that was sent, the Holy Spirit. I thank God for Pastor Dave Roberson over and over lovingly but relentlessly <laughs> nudging, urging, pushing, if you'll allow me, with humor and love back into the classrooms of the Holy Ghost. Pray in other tongues, he would say. He would quote 1 Corinthians 14, I believe it's verse 2 where he says, When you speak in an unknown tongue, no man understands you. You're speaking with God. And you're communicating mysteries. And Dave would teach us. He'd say, well, now we know two things. Let me see if I can do it better. He that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men, but unto God. No man understands him. How be it in the Spirit he speak in mysteries. And Dave would stop us right there and tease us. He says, now, we know that you're talking with God when you're speaking in tongues and mysteries are being communicated. Now, let's see now. How many of you think that while that's going on, you are explaining mysteries to God? <laughs> and of course, we'd all laugh. You know, Dave would say, no, no, God understood all mysteries many millennia before you came along. <laughs> no, he is explaining mysteries to you. It's everything Christ is in you to you and through you it's it's and then he said it's the understanding you're also praying the understanding of the mysteries of god in the in the bible see paul talks about this in first corinthians chapter 2 he, he says now we have received not the spirit of the world he's talking about when you get born again you don't receive again the spirit from adam the spirit of the world but the spirit which is of god why that we may know the things that are freely given to us of God. These things we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy, Sp Holy Spirit teaches. <laughs> he says, the carnal man receives not the things of God, their foolishness unto him, neither can he know them. But we speak those things which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual with spiritual. For the things of God are spiritually discerned. And that's why Dave would say, if you'll spend time in the Word of God, reading it with your natural eye and it goes into your intellect, well, good. But he says, then if you'll spend time praying in the Holy Ghost, it's like you've, you've now sat down in a university classroom and you're ready to learn and you've got your book and you've read your assignment. But here comes the finely dressed gentleman into the room he walks up to the chalkboard today i guess it'd be a whiteboard today it might be an electronic whiteboard <laughs> but the finely jet dressed gentleman at the chalkboard he is the holy spirit and he has come on purpose to teach you the understandings of the very words you're reading the mysteries you're reading in the in the book god gave us a book 
and the Bible, and God gave us a teacher, the Holy Spirit. And we all would be wise to take advantage of both. All right, back to the little teaching vision here. Because exactly what the Holy Spirit was doing. So I, I, I've digressed quite a bit. I'm looking at the clock there. <laughs> I'm already 25 minutes and it seemed like I started to me five minutes ago. So in this vision, I saw a single dot of light on planet Earth. It was coming out of Israel. It was moving and I knew that represented Jesus and he was going from village to village and everywhere he went, boy, those that sat in darkness, which is everybody, <laughs> they saw a great light. You know, and then Jesus, he also, sent, first he sent out the 12, then he sent out 70 more, and he basically gave them the same assignment. He says, I, I want you to go and preach. Uh, two by two, you go into these villages. I want you to heal the sick and cast out devils. I want you to proclaim the kingdom of God. And one, he even said, raise the dead, heal the sick, cast out devils. But see, I, I kind of knew that happened in this vision, but when they went out and were doing those very works, they were doing it. But in my vision, I didn't see more lights appear. They weren't born again yet. They were doing everything they did in His name because He is the Lord and Master that God has appointed over the earth. So He had authority to send them out and the Holy Spirit would go with them and when they would speak or command or bless or lay hands on to heal in his name, then the Holy Spirit would work with them, confirming the word that they were preaching. That's why Jesus said, well, you know the Holy Spirit, for he's with you. And that, that was the relationship they had at the time, because they weren't born again yet. They said, well, he's with you. But he, then he says, ah, but he shall be in you. And that's because they were going to get born again. See, John, Jesus prophesying about that day. And uh, this is in John chapter 8, verse 12, I believe it is. And again, he mentions about being the light of the world. And he says, but those that, those that follow me, they're not going to walk in darkness. For they will have the light of life. And he's prophesying about the day that those that believe on him will have the same light of life in them that he has at that moment in him. At that moment, he's the single dot of light. He's the only one on planet Earth. And through that single light, God was able to do all of these works. And then, because of Jesus having the authority that he had, all authority in heaven and earth, he, he laid his hand on, I'm, well, I'm going to say it this way. He authorized his disciples, first the 12, then the 70. In addition, they could go do the same things, but they were not born again at that point. The Holy Spirit was working with them, but not in them. So I didn't see more lights appear, even though they were doing the same works. Okay. Now, the subject is the night when no man can work. So in that vision, I saw all of that. And I thought, well, is it? The works are still going on. The works are still happening. When is that night when no man can work? When is that? And the very next thing I saw was Jesus on the cross. Now, he's already been through the beating he got from the Roman guards where they'd slap him in the face and say, prophesy. And you know, his eyes were probably blacked at that point, no telling he might have had, they might have broken his nose. You know, they'd, they'd, they'd put a mock robe on him and covered his face and say, prophesy, tell him. They'd hit him, who hit you? And that's where it started. And they put a crown of thorns on his head. And boy, those thorns, if you've ever seen them, they're like two inches long. And the blood had to just be coming down. Then he went to this for the scourging and well, if you've never seen that in Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ, I think Mel did a pretty good job, but I also think it was much worse than that. But hey, boy, they, they striped him, you know, and it was, it, the Jews were limited to 39 stripes, you know, 40 stripes less one. The Romans had no limitations like that. And their whips that they whipped him with at the tips had bone and glass and 
and maybe uh, iron uh, metal right sewn in somehow right to the tips of, the, of that lash and I mean they would they would rip and tear the flesh when Isaiah saw him prophetically hundreds of years before the prophet Isaiah saw a vision of Christ on the cross he said it's his his visage his countenance the way he looked he was marred more than any man and then if you read it in the Amplified or some a really good translation, what it's really saying is he hardly looked human. You're wondering what is that? <laughs> what a you know? Now, I didn't see it that bad, but I saw Jesus much like the way uh, it's portrayed in that movie of Mel Gibson's *The Passion of the Christ*: bloody, beaten crown of thorns on his head blood just a bloody mass wounds everywhere and it was right near the end if you can picture Jesus and he was heaving with it was every breath was more difficult I saw him. sorry Of course, he said several things on there, you know, my God, my God, which is prophesied in the songs. Why hast thou forsaken me? But he, he's saying that because it's prophesied in the Psalms. He knew why. But he had never known separation from his father. Sorry, I've got to finish this. Anyway, I saw, I saw him, this bloody mass of uh, a human, tortured. He was, the, at the same time, the Lamb of God. The innocent, it goes all the way back to the garden when the innocent blood had to be shed for, for Adam and Eve. There he is, the innocent Lamb of God, shedding his blood. Him paying the price for what I deserved and for what you deserved. He was the Lamb of God, but he was also the serpent on the pole because right near the end, the last thing that he said was, of course, he said, it is finished. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But the last thing that he said was Father. Oh, he said, he also said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Thank God he said that. <laughs> Thank God. But the last thing that he said was, Father, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Because he was going, he was not only the lamb that was slain. He was the serpent on the pole when he'd already prophesied. He said, as as Moses raised up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. See, he didn't, he, yes, he was the Lamb of God who shed his blood, but he was also the serpent. And the type is from Pharaoh's court when the magicians threw down their rod, but Aaron, got, Moses had already thrown down Aaron's rod. And it had become a snake. And so the magicians, they threw down their rods and they became snakes. And of course, that's a type of sin. But the serpent from Aaron's rod, well, Aaron's rod is made of wood, of course. It's a type of the cross. It's talking about Jesus on that cross who became sin and swallowed up all of the sin of Adam, all of the sin of the whole world, really, into himself. Right before he physically dies, Jesus says to the Father, into your hand, I commit my spirit. Now, there's a real reason for that. <laughs> let, me, let me talk about the night first, and then we'll come back to the reason. Why, why did Jesus say those words, into thy hand, I commit my spirit? But let's go back to the night when no man works, because I kept saying, what is that? Before that, I saw a single light moving through village to village, 
doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, casting out devils. Then it switches to the cross and I see him heaving and struggling for every breath. Every breath is more painful than the last. And finally he says those words, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And it says he gave up the ghost. Jesus of Nazareth died. Did you know the Bible says at that moment when he died, the, the, the curtain in the temple that separated the holy holies was ripped from the top to the bottom. I know that had to be an angel just ripping that thing. Did you know it says that the rocks were split and there was a big earthquake? I mean, this is a momentous thing. When the Lamb, the Son of God, the serpent on the pole died, and in my vision, the moment that he says, that it says he gave up the ghost, <sighs> suddenly I saw from my vision from outer space looking on the world, satellite view, the light went out. It appeared that death had won. No doubt there was jubilation in hell, or amongst the devils anyway, I don't know. Satan thought he'd won. I'm sure the demons thought he'd won, the thought that the devil had won. They had stamped out the life of the Son of God. See, there's a reason why Jesus said into my hand, excuse me, there is a reason why Jesus said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. You talk about faith, you talk about trust in God. Because here the, the human part of Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, the man, voluntarily is becoming sin. And when he dies, again, Jesus prophesied himself. He's the one that told this. He said, like Jonah, like Jonah from the Old Testament, like he suffered in the belly of the whale, like Jonah, the Son of Man must suffer in the heart of the earth. And for three days and nights, Jesus suffered. He suffered in the heart of the earth. And that's... I'm telling you, those three days were the night, looking on it from outer space, looking on it from the satellite view. When he gave up the ghost on the cross, I'm telling you, the light went out. And there's not a single vessel on planet Earth with the light of God on the inside of him. No man could work during that time. There was not a single person, not one left. From God's point of view, the whole earth was darkness and every human in it was darkness. And his son was suffering in the bowels of the earth. Here's why Jesus said those words and prayed, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Because when Jesus, when he becomes sin and he's confined in the heart of the earth, he has no power now to get himself out of hell. When he says, I'm trusting my spirit to you, Father, he's relying on the promise that was given in, the, in the, the Old Testament. It's a prophecy concerning Jesus where it says, Thou shalt not leave my soul in hell, neither shall my flesh see corruption. He is trusting the Father to raise him from the dead. And even that part about my flesh will not see corruption, what that means to the Jewish mind is on the fourth day, that's when corruption would set in. That's why when Jesus was about to raise Lazarus from the dead, they said to him, No, Lord, by now he stinketh. Well, it was the fourth day. So Jesus, from the Psalms, from the Word of God, knew that there was a promise that God would not... See, if God doesn't come through on that, Jesus is trapped in hell forever. 
There is no way out for all eternity. But only Jesus had this promise. You will not leave my soul in hell. Neither will my flesh see corruption, meaning he'll have to be raised before the fourth day. God. Oh, it's all so good. Hang on. Hang on. I feel. Let me soothe the throat a little bit. Hallelujah. So Jesus is trusting that his father will raise him from the dead. So back now, you know what happened on the on resurrection morning. Now we're talking to Easter. This is an Easter Sunday message. He appears to Mary. I'm not going to go through the whole story. God, after three days, quickened him from the dead. And the Bible literally says that Jesus is the first born from the dead. He's the firstborn from the dead. It says it's more than just being raised. Lazarus had already been raised from the dead, but he died again. In the uh, Old Testament, the prophets, there were several people raised, raised from the dead, but they died again. So when it, it, you wouldn't have said they were birthed from the dead. No, they were raised from the dead. Well, Jesus was raised from the dead, but it was more than just being raised. He was reborn. He is the first born from the dead. Then God glorified him. He received his glorified body, which allowed him to walk through walls and to eat a fish and then walk back through the wall and the fish not slide down the wall. I don't know how that works. <laughs> but his body had become glorified where he could, like the angels can go invisible, invisible and that type of thing. Well, his body now is not limited like like ours but why was he glorified and seated at the right hand of the father because the and i were back to that mercy thing see it was not good enough see if the if the gospel ended at the cross we would be where the blood was shed by the lamb we would be just like adam and eve in the garden when god killed something something innocent had to die shed its blood it paid the price and then they were clothed with the skin of that animal. If the gospel ended at the cross, okay, going back to them, so they were forgiven, but they were not changed. They were still sinners at heart. If the gospel ended at the cross, we would be in that same position. The blood had been shed for our forgiveness. We would be forgiven, but we would still be forgiven sinners. Our nature would not be changed. We would be forgiven but not in the image of God. And that is not what God wanted. He did not want forgiven sinners. He wanted us back the way he originally made us, in the image of God. Spirit-born children that resemble their father. Glory to God, I'm preaching myself happy now. So if the gospel ended at the cross, there would still, still be no lights on planet Earth. It would still all be dark. It'd be the night when no man can work. Thank God on that third day, on Resurrection Sunday, on the day we call it Easter. Thank God Jesus was quickened to life. Yes, he rose from the dead, but more than that, he was reborn of God's Spirit. He is the firstborn born, not just raised, born from the dead, and he'll never die again. Then he was glorified, seated at the right hand of the Father, so that by faith in him, he is the seed that fell into the ground and died. He is the seed now when we receive it. See, what are, I, I've been talking about an orange seed. We have oranges today because there was an original orange that God made back there. How do we have oranges today? Seeds. Seeds are planted from one generation to another. All, we have an orange today because there was an original orange and we, God was good enough to give us seeds inside the orange that would produce an additional orange tree where we could get more 
oranges. Well, God is, in nature, God is preaching the gospel all the time. That's exactly what he's done with his son. He, there, he, there was an original tree, Jesus. He produced all this fruit. We want more fruit. He says, okay, tell you what, I'm going to sow a seed into you that will produce the tree of a new man that you will nurture to maturity and the works that he did you shall do also. Glory to God. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. He intends... <laughs> Thank God for the cross. That's where we receive mercy. That's where our sins were forgiven. But you would not be born again if there was no resurrection. You would just be a forgiven sinner. But you're not just, you are, you were a sinner, you've been forgiven. But when you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you were quickened from death to life. With the, and by the way, with the very same identical life that quickened Jesus, not something less. The same life that quickened him quickened you. The book of Ephesians, and I believe it's chapter 2, says that we were quickened together with him, raised together with him, and there was raised and seated at the right hand of the Father in him. And in the Greek language, I still remember the day Jim Martin called me all excited. This was many years ago because he had discovered from the Greek, you know, leave it to Jim. He's, he's a more of a scholar than most of us. He said, Gary, Gary, did, do you know that in the Greek tenses, the Greek language, when it says in Ephesians that we were quickened together with him, raised together with him, and seated at the right hand of the Father in him, did you know in the Greek language, it's like it all happened at the same time? Not he was raised, or he, yeah, he was quickened, raised, and seated, and then 2,000 years, Gary was quickened, raised, and seated. That's the way we see it. But he said, God lives outside of time. And what the Greek language actually says from God's mind, that all happened at the same time. <laughs> We're positioned from the point of God in Him 2,000 years ago. <laughs> Good Lord Almighty. But anyway, back to my back to my vision. I'm see I'm getting a little close on time. Jesus appeared to Mary. He told Mary, "You go tell the, my disciples that I've risen, that you've seen me. Go tell them." By the way, the first person to preach the gospel of He is risen was a woman. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Secondly, you know who she preached it to? The apostles. <laughs> Get over yourself. <laughs> of course, not all of them believed it. You know, Thomas, I'll not believe unless I see in his hands where they pierced him and put my hand in his side where they thrust the spear in, you know. But get this, they did eventually believe. Mary was the first one to see him. She told the twelve. Then Jesus himself appeared to the twelve. Jesus, in fact, appeared, it says, to over 500 people after he was raised from the dead and stayed with them for quite a while and, and taught them before he ascended into heaven. Back to my vision from outer space, as the word began to spread that Jesus, God has raised his son Jesus from the dead and he has been ex exalted to be Lord and Christ. As people would believe, see what does is, what is, uh, Romans chapter 10 say? If you believe in your heart, that God has raised him from the dead, and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved. Well, that began happening. And in my, my vision, when Jesus was quickened from the dead, boom, there's that dot of light again. Same dot as before. That same life is now inside the human vessel again. But now as people believe, oh, look, look, now there's two lights, two of, huh, now there's 12. Look, then there's 500 lights and then Peter preaches on the day of Pentecost and there's 3,000 and then he preaches again and there's 5,000. <laughs> and the, it, it just spread these lights. It looks now it starts looking more like that one we've all seen where it shows the, the 
lights at night all over the world and they're everywhere and that's it and th it's spreading more and more lights all the time and that's why jesus he prophesied to believers he said about himself he said while he was on planet earth i am the light of the world and i'm the light of the world as long as i'm here but he prophesied to them he said you are salt you're the salt of the earth and he also said prophesying to believers like it's already done and god always calls those things that be not as though they were he's prophesying to them that the knowing that the day will come that the same life that's in him will be in them he prophesies now he says you are the salt of the earth you are the light of the world you don't set it's just a city set on a hill cannot be hidden don't hide your light under a bushel cause them to glorify your father by your good works oh he must mean like giving to the poor wait a minute we're, we're told to do that privately just between us and God so it can't be them glorifying God for your good works of giving you're not supposed to even let them know oh it, it, it must be my the works must be fasting that's it must be fasting no you, you don't fast you don't let other people know as much as possible you don't let them know when you're fasting so it can't be giving can't be fasting fasting is something just between you and god oh, it's my prayers that's what it is <laughs> no. when you pray go into your closet don't be you know standing on the corners and giving loud prayers of course a lot of times we have to pray in public the what he's saying is you don't do those things to get the glory from man you do those things because that's just who you are in relationship with your father the things you do in secret with him, he rewards you openly and they can see that. So when he says, don't hide your light under a bush or let your, let your works be seen, like sit on a hill. What works is he talking about? Now we're at John chapter 14 and verse 12, I believe it is. He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also and greater than these shall he do because I go unto my Father. Jesus was glorified. You know, Jesus, I'm going to get the orange back out again, because it, to me it represents him so just so perfectly. See, God could have chosen to just leave Jesus here and be the only light on planet Earth, be the only light and, and uh, commission dead people, dead spiritually, commission them to go out in his name and do the works so he would only have had one son on earth if God would have chosen to do it that way but see that's not what God wanted and from the beginning God has wanted a family made in his image a family where that he could fellowship with in the cool of the day a family who loved him from their heart not because they were programmed to do it or forced to do it in church or something, but because that's, they really do love him. God's always wanted a family that he could love and fellowship with. He wasn't content to have just one, just one that he could work through on planet Earth. No, Jesus is the firstborn of many brethren. We, we get more oranges by planting the seed that produces a tree that produces the oranges. God did a very similar thing. He planted Christ in you with seeds. The seeds are the words of the gospel. My spirit, my words, he said, my words are spirit. They are life. Heaven and earth will pass away. My words will never pass away. That's why Paul said in Romans, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power, the dunamis power. What is gospel? Gospel is made up of words. I am not ashamed of the gospel, the words that tell the story of Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power. Remember the lesson a few weeks ago? No word of God is void of power. The word of God is like seeds. 
and every seed has the power to produce the image that's in it. The gospel is the seed of God that contains the image of Christ. And when you become a believer, Christ is sown in you like a seed. But the same way he told me, you don't plant a seed to get an orange, you plant a seed to get an orange tree that produces the oranges. You know, remember that? God planted a seed in you that produced a tree. Let me say, you know, Jesus said, make the tree good or the tree bad. But, you know, he often compares us to trees. He says, God sowed Christ into you as a seed. It produces a tree, if you'll allow me, which is the new man. But like any fruit tree, that no fruit tree comes out of the ground fully mature. It has to be nurtured and watered. So it is with the new man. That's why Peter said, desire the sincere milk of the word that you, he said, as newborn babes, newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And God gave us apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers and evangelists for the work of the ministry and so forth. But the end result is that we may grow up into Christ no longer being blown around by every wind of doctrine. But the, we might grow, that new man, it's like a, a tree, it's got to come to maturity. Now God can use you in the gifts no matter what. It doesn't take maturity to operate in the gifts. We find that out in 1 Corinthians. Chapter 12 is where we have our most information about the gifts of the Spirit. In chapter one, he says, you Corinthians, you bunch, you don't come behind in any gift. But he also called them spiritually ba spiritual babies. So God can use you in the gifts while you're a baby. And that's not a bad way. I mean, he says, covet earnestly the best gifts. But then he says, let me show you a more excellent way. And that's for 1 Corinthians chapter 13. That's the love chapter. See, and God is love. When you mature, you're going to be love. I mean, <laughs> the seed of love has already been planted in here. Boy, I'm about out of time. <laughs> Just like the orange. When you plant the seed, you don't get another orange. You get a tree. You get a, a, a new orange tree. It, it's a sapling. It doesn't produce fruit at first. It's got to come to maturity. See, this is God, that's what God wants. Christ, this new man. Now, Christ himself is mature, but we're talking about the new man in you. It's got to be nurtured. Got to be brought to maturity. But boy, when it is, when it is, It'll produce fruit. It'll produce fruit. Now get this. Fruit trees are different than seed crops, you know, like wheat or corn and that type of crop. You plant the seed, you do the right things with it, you nurture it, water it, and you get a harvest. But you know what? You gotta re-sow that field every year. If you want corn the next year, you gotta sow it again. If you want wheat the next year, you gotta sow it again. Fruit trees are not that way. Fruit trees. Once it comes to maturity, it produces fruit every due season. My dad planted some apple trees when he retired. Those apple trees produce fruit for the next 40 years without him ever having to grow another tree. I'm out of time. I <laughs> gotta go. Happy Easter. Thank God for the resurrection. We are not just forgiven sinners. We have been reborn by the very Spirit of God. You are part of a new species, Adam. Your, your Adam is Christ and your Father is God. Thank God for the resurrection that we have been born again. Happy Easter. Happy Resurrection Day. See you next time. Bye-bye.